Hello and welcome to this edition of Healthy Living. I'm your host, Kelly Lamb. When I say springtime, what comes to mind? If you're one of 50 million Americans who suffer from seasonal allergies, then probably what comes to mind is the yellow pollen that covers everything in the spring, the itchy, watery eyes, the runny nose. Well, today we welcome Dr. Block, allergy, immunology, and respiratory disease specialist here with us. Hopefully, Dr. Block will be able to help us sort out the facts and also provide us with a little relief. Join us. Welcome back to Healthy Living. I'm your host, Kelly Lamb. Today we welcome Dr. Block, Allergy, Immunology, and Respiratory Disease Specialist. We want to welcome you and thank you for joining us here in our studios. Um, as we were chatting back and forth earlier and I rat rattled off that big long title, you said, well, I'd rather, rather it be an allergist. So tell me, what is an allergist? Okay. Kelly, an allergist is a medical doctor, an MD, or, or a DO that, that has, uh, has gone through uh, either internal medicine or pediatric training. Mm -hmm. and, and for myself, it's pediatrics. Okay. And, and I, I, I'm a board certified pediatrician before going into the allergy okay. training. I did my allergy training at, uh, at Vanderbilt. And uh, it's at least a two year program, can be longer. And uh, we learn an awfully lot about mechanisms and how to help people out that have problems with the itchy eyes, runny nose, sneezing, right. the coughing, the wheezing, the itching, and, and uh, other allergic manifestations. And uh, in uh, common practice, I do much, much more allergy than I do immunology. Okay. And, and that's honestly because most of the immunology problems are pretty unusual and, and they also require a lot of uh, pretty specialized equipment and tests to, uh, to do what you have to do to find out and diagnose. Sure, but I, I'm sure that here in western Kentucky there are no shortage of people with allergies. Oh, no and shortage. So let's, no. let's tell our audience what are seasonal allergies and why do they happen? Okay, seasonal allergies or I guess, uh, where do we start? Uh, in, in the spring, mm -hmm. there are all sorts of things that happen and trees, uh, primarily in the early part of spring, uh, that's the time of year they try to make seed. And when they're trying to make seed, they make a lot of pollen, which is essentially the, the, the male part that will join with the egg, the female part, and, and, and become seed. Well, trees can't exactly uproot and go uh, get together. Sure. So they have to make a lot of pollen, and it, and they have to hope that it blows around, and and ends up in the right place. Sure. And, and usually it does. Uh, the uh, the trouble that we get into with the, with the allergies is is almost a, a mistaken identity kind of thing. Sure. And, and what happens is the, uh, the grains of pollen, instead of landing on the, the female part of the tree, and, and some, some plants actually, some trees actually have male trees and female trees. Uh -huh. uh, and, and the male trees just make pollen and the female trees don't make pollen, but they make uh, seeds or berries or fruits or, or whatever. And, uh, but, but what happens, the pollen, the male part, lands on the uh, mucous membrane, say inside our nose or our eye, where it's kind of wet and moist, and that is similar to what it would be landing on uh, on the female part of the, of the uh, flower that, that they're planning on making a seed with. I see. And what happens at that point is when the pollen grain lands, it's a little bit like dropping a tea bag in a glass of <laughs> hot water, and, and there are little holes in the uh, pollen grain as a rule, and, and some enzymes kind of go leaching out. Kind of like when you drop a tea bag in, you see the tea spreading out. And it's really a mistaken identity and it's an unfortunate pollen grain that landed there because, well, it's not going to make a seed. But 
what else happens is when those enzymes get to spreading around in the mucus or through the top layer of cells in the eye or the nose or further down in in the uh, respiratory tract in the breathing tubes and such, then it triggers a reaction from uh, some antibodies that are called immunoglobulin E or IgE that ordinarily are there to protect us against parasite diseases. And those uh, IgE antibodies are lined up in little plug-in receptors, so to speak, along the outside surface of some cells called mast cells, M-A-S-T. Well, it's not because they look kind of like a part of a sailboat, but, but when they were naming cells a long time ago, uh, they found that these particular cells showed up very well under the microscope with metachromatic acid staining technique. Well, they'd already named a bunch of cells for what they had uh, uh, found them with, like the uh, neutrophils, uh, which the, the long name for that is polymorphonuclear leukocytes, but uh, neutrophils uh, showed up with neutrophilic stain. Okay. And, uh, the uh, eosinophils showed up with eosinophilic stain. And so, but, but metachromatic acid staining technique uh, cells, well, it was kind of long. So they decided sure. they'd shorten it to make it mast cells. Mass. Well, on the inside of the mast cells, uh, there's preformed uh, kind of chemical mediators, you'd say, in, in what they call granules. And they're ready to, uh, be released whenever they're triggered to do so. And the little uh, IgE uh, or immune globulin E antibody things on the outside surface, if we get several of those reacting at the same time, then it triggers the mast cell to release its histamine. Okay. And the histamine is released into the surrounding area. And, and we've all known that, uh, that we take antihistamines to keep the stuff mm -hmm. from causing us so much trouble in the spring and fall. Well, that's to keep the histamine that is released from causing so much aggravation and trouble and such. Okay. Now, what does histamine do? Uh, it depends on what kind of cell it bumps into. But most cells have what they call a histamine receptor, and it's kind of a place where the histamine molecule can plug into, mm -hmm. and it causes an action. And if you happen to be a nerve cell, well then that and histamine bumps into you and plugs in, well you get real itchy. And you send that itch message on up to the brain. Oh, why would that be useful? Well, if, uh, if there was a parasite or a bug or something that was trying to bore through the skin to get to you, well, making you itchy in that place might be useful because it may be to scratch them off before glory would get in good. So that's kind of protective in that way. Uh, if it happens to go to a blood vessel, um, then what happens is it affects the cells that line the blood vessel. And a lot of times I draw pictures, but, uh, but what, what you find looking at a small blood vessel is it's not like a plastic tube, but it's a whole bunch of little cells kind of around a, a round tube, kind of. Okay. And those little cells are more like the tiles in a bathroom wall. <laughs> and when histamine hits that, those cells, well, they don't stay nice and flat and like tiles, they kind of ball up. And when they ball up, it leaves some space in between. Now, ordinarily, those cells have uh, what we call intercellular adhesion molecules, which is really kind of like Velcro. <laughs> and to kind of keep them in position when we're moving and grooving and stuff, you know, so they don't get leaky all the time. But when the histamine or other things like histamine hit them, they pull apart, and there's some Velcro loose here, kind of, or the intercellular, or ICAM as they call it for short usually. And those places are uh, kind of hanging out, and there's a little bit of histamine kind of moves out into the blood vessel, and a lot of the clear fluid that makes up our blood, you know, our blood's part cellular, part red cells, part white cells, and and a lot clear fluid. And, and usually when you spin down a hematocrit or something, the cellular part amounts to 30 something to maybe 42% or something like that. And so the rest of it's clear stuff. 
So there's a lot of that that can leak out. Now, what's the advantage of some of that leaking out? Well, it works to kind of give the cells that might be wanting to get through there a little bit more room because the cells that make up the muscles and the connective tissue around there, instead of being tight together with that extra fluid in there, there's more room. Uh, it's just kind of a neat system. Yep. And so a little bit of histamines come out. There's a, a place to crawl through if you're, a, say, a white blood cell looking uh -huh. for an invader. And, uh, and there's also some Velcro to grab hold of. So they come through there, they taste the histamine, they grab a hold of the Velcro, and they wiggle through, and they go out to see what the heck's causing trouble. Yeah. See where the invader is, uh, well, those, or, or whatever. Those mast now, cells make me have a love-hate relationship with Well, well that's true, that's true. I mean, it's a good idea to have them, sure. but they're kind of uh, a little bit like Homeland Security, sometimes it gets a little carried away. That, that's, uh, that's a wonderful way to describe that. But uh, what happens then is the, uh, Usually, what happens at, to start with anyway, the white cells that are called eosinophils kind of come in first. And eosinophils have little granules and stuff too, and, and they're real good parasite killers. Okay. Because the granules they have are probably the most toxic things that we make in our body. Mm -hmm. and, and they come in and they look around for a, a parasite or a worm or a larva or a schistosome or, or whatever it might be there that they think they're supposed to be protecting against. And after they've looked around there for a long time and they don't find anything, well, they just kind of release their toxic granules anyway. So, well, dang, must be around here somewhere. So they spray the area down like, uh, and there's, you know, collateral damage. Sure, it, we, we it get causes, those it causes a lot of eyes and the runny nose. It does. And, and and it also causes the, the, the mucus production. Right. And, it causes, and the swelling is from, you know, the leaky blood vessels and such. And, and, and all this business uh, is set up to protect us from invaders, more or less. Right. But the, those, those symptoms that you're naming that, and that come to my mind and our, and our viewers' minds, mm -hmm. which I know we'll um, put up on the screen for everyone to see, um, are so common with the common cold. Yeah. So how do we tell and how do doctors tell what's the difference between a seasonal allergy and a common cold? Well, it's hard sometimes okay. because a lot of the symptoms are the same. Right. And, and, uh, and a lot of the nasal congestion and uh, the, especially the clear nasal drainage, which we get, yes. and, and sometimes the watery eyes too, uh, are, are the same. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, the, the old saying that, uh, well, a cold gets well in about a week if you treat it and about seven days if you don't. Uh, I mean, you know, the cold's sure. over with. Right. Now, uh, allergies usually last longer than that. That's right. Now, that's, that's not very handy to start with, though, okay. because uh, you'd think, well, gee, uh, I, just I, I don't have want to, to wait, wait a week. <laughs> I don't want to wait a week before I decide to treat to the treat. allergies. Mm -hmm. um, some of the treatment would be about the same anyway. Mm -hmm. but, but the other things... With the cold, you usually are a little more achy. You usually have uh, your nasal drainage may turn from from clear to, to cloudy quicker. Okay. Uh, you also may run fever, and, and you're you know you're just wore out. And, and your eyes, instead of being so itchy a lot of times, are more burny, sure. a little bit more, uh, and. Of course, of course, back in the old days, uh, we used to talk about uh, having a cold at, for a long time. And, and, and when I was a kid, I remember some of them saying, well, gosh, uh, he, he, he doesn't have but two colds a year. It's just one of them starts about time school starts and it's over about, uh, That's right. about, about Thanksgiving. That's and, right. And, and, and the other one starts about time spring gets here and, right. and is over when it gets hot. So just two colds, uh, you know. Right. I think maybe they were partly joking, but uh, so. But it, it's, in essence, we it, some it, of us may it, even it, be it, walking around with allergies oh, and not know it. Oh, frequently, uh, I'd say very commonly. And one of the things that people, uh, a lot of folks that come into the office say is, "Well, I've got sinus," and say, "Well, yeah, uh, you've got a sinus here, a sinus here, and another sinus here and here, and a whole bunch of little ones inside there, and a bigger one if you drilled a hole here and here, yeah." Well, no, that's not what they mean. They don't mean right. they gotta, right. they've got the little rooms in there. Uh, they mean that they have 
symptoms that involve their sinuses, and, and a lot of times that is allergy. Mm -hmm. However, it can become a sinus infection, yes. and that's another thing that we people sometimes confuse yes. with allergies. Uh, allergies do tend to make you a little more prone to getting sinus infections, mm -hmm. and uh, part of that is through interfering with the natural openings that the sinuses have. Yes. Sinuses, like just about all of our respiratory epithelium or, or the lining of our respiratory tract, uh, have little cilia. Mm -hmm. And cilia are like little hair-like projections on the, uh, on the cells that, uh, that, that line the mucosa or the surface of the inside of the nose or inside of the uh, uh, bronchial tubes and, and, and on down to a certain point and after you get down so far we don't have any more but right. because there's not room for them but uh, those cilia do a really neat thing and and, uh, and they kind of keep this place self-cleaning mm -hmm. now how's the nose be self-cleaning uh, well the other little cells that are in there are mucus producing cells and sometimes they go crazy too uh, mucus producing cells are kind of called goblet cells and they're called goblet cells because when you make a section to look under the microscope and you go across the side of them and cut a very thin layer like that, they look like a goblet. And the goblet part is uh, kind of lined up with the surface here and we got a little cilia waving out here okay. and, and what happens is the goblet cells produce mucus and the other cells leak enough of the clear fluid, kind of like from the blood, uh, and, and, uh, and that makes a floating thing for the cilia. The mucus floats on top of the clear stuff and the cilia wave and it moves the mucus along. And it's almost like a, a regenerating conveyor belt. I see. And, and so the dust and mold or germs or pollens or whatever lands in there ends up running down your throat and into your stomach. And that's part of the reason why we have kind of an irritated throat when we have allergies right, too. Right, right. So I've, I've gotten these symptoms and I've carried them long past a week and so I, I think I have seasonal allergies. I've come to the doctor and mm -hmm. he said, yes, yes you do. Are there some day-to-day uh, -day interactions that, I, that, that make those worse? What, what can well, I sure, avoid? Sure. Well, number one, you kind of need to pay attention a little bit. Right and some of us do that better than others. Uh, there's probably gonna be circumstances where you're worse. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, gosh, I was quite a bit worse while I was sweeping all that yellow and green dust off the porch. You say, well, yeah, maybe so. Uh, I was quite a bit worse when the wind was blowing. Um, when the wind blows, it stirs up everything a little. Right. And, and they've done studies and they've kind of looked at that. At, on windy days, uh, particularly in, uh, in the country or in agricultural areas. Maybe you may have, uh, on a non-windy day, maybe uh, 100 to 500 pollen grains or mold spores per cubic meter, and it may jump up to a million or something right. per cubic meter right. on a real windy day, particularly when it's around harvest time and there's a lot of mold around or when there's a lot of ragweed pollen or when there's a lot of tree pollen. Uh, the uh, what else? other things to do. When, uh, when it's like that, uh, even though it's nice outside and when there's lots of pollen out, you may want to use your air conditioner. In fact, you probably should. Mm -hmm. If you uh, use your air conditioner, it cuts an awfully, awfully lot of the pollen and mold and such down that would get into the house. Uh, probably a millionth of what's outside right. will get through. Right. And if you don't do stuff like that, then you may have ragweed to enjoy every time you vacuum. Uh, and, and then they've actually found ragweed pollen in people's carpets in February, wow. uh, left over from the previous fall. Mm -hmm. Now that pollen is not live anymore, but uh, that doesn't Still there. Uh, that doesn't keep it from causing trouble right. because the uh, the part where you land on a mucous membrane and the enzymes diffuse out, they don't have to be alive for that. Right. I, I know uh, that with my, my husband and my son, we always put them in the shower immediately after they've come in from mowing the yard well, and, and things that's right. like that. And that, that's one of the other things. When you're outside, you're going to pick up pollen. Mm -hmm. Your pets are going to pick up pollen. And... Uh, 
it's probably a good idea to at least wipe your pets down sure. if, if, if they're outside much. A and a more frequent bath is a good idea too. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, a very good idea if you've spent the day outside to, to take a bath probably before you go to bed instead of bringing all that pollen that's stuck right. on your hair and, and such right. into the bed and putting it on your pillow so you'll get a chance to uh, breathe it in through your nose through the night. Right. Uh, what else? Uh, driving around in the car, uh, I mean, it's a huge difference whether you have the windows down or whether you run air conditioner. Right. And if you're a seasonal allergy sufferer, air conditioner is quite a bit better. Uh, again, it's a factor of, of 100,000 fold or something, what, what difference wow. you can make. Wow. And, and, and more like a million fold if you get a convertible versus an air conditioned car. That's right. That's right. Uh, what else? The other things, if you have to do a bunch of work outside and such, then uh, even putting sunglasses on will cut down a lot, or, or wearing your we'll other glasses your will make a difference. And if you've got wraparound sunglasses or goggles, it makes an even bigger difference. And if you're going to have to do things that would stir up things, like mowing or raking or things like that, then putting a mask on would not be a bad idea. Uh, it looks a little funny, but... Uh, uh, they said, who is that mask man? But, uh, <laughs> if you uh, don't go to bed miserable, it's well, well worth it. Well, it's probably worth it, yeah. And what else? Uh, that's, that's probably most of it. All right. Well, uh, one thing the, that I... What, now, now pre-medicating, if you find yes. that you have a... Uh, if you find that you do pretty good with a certain antihistamine or something, and it doesn't uh, give you so much side effects that you have a hard time coping, and, and you just about be... Uh, happier sneezing than to be asleep, uh, which, you know, that's, that's kind of how I would be with right. Benadryl, but it right. uh, but doesn't affect everybody that way. And it seems some people do allergy shots. They what? do. Now, let me get to the medicines just a dab more, sure. and we'll do the allergy shots in just mm -hmm. a second. Uh, used, what we used to always say was avoidance if you can, medications, and then if that doesn't work very well, then allergy shots. Yes. Now, we're maybe a little quicker to go to allergy shots because we've kind of found that over the long Hall, that is probably the most cost-effective way of doing it mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're going to continue to be exposed to the things that, and, and if you're going to live around here, you're going to be exposed to That's the right. things that cause trouble. That's right. Because nobody so far has come up with a very good bubble for us to live in. Yeah. And, and, you know, the trouble with the hamster and the ball is it doesn't fit very well to <laughs> a lot of places. And, and, and you know, it, it, it won't work very well for people, I'm afraid. Um, the, uh, the other things besides antihistamines, there are uh, uh, topical steroid nasal sprays and topical antihistamine sprays that do very good. And there's uh, also uh, eye drops that uh, usually are based on antihistamine. And, uh, and if it's really bad, we use a mild steroid sometimes. And uh, let's see. Uh, but as far as allergy shots, mm -hmm. you're starting to talk about that. Um, what the allergy shots do is back to when we were talking about the IgE molecule on the mast cell, the allergy shots uh, sort of make us quit making so much IgE uh, triggers for the mast cell. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing about that is, is it's the nearest thing we got to a cure for it. But what we do to do allergy shots, we would have to do some testing, which involves putting uh, what's called an extract. And an extract is more or less a tea made with the different things that we're thinking about. And if we were going to make a uh, tea with well, what's going on outside now, the grass pollen is just getting started. Yes. And we would collect a bunch of grass and grass pollen. And, and how they do that's kind of interesting. They may have a field of this kind of grass and they will go through with a tractor with a big vacuum cleaner on it. And, and they'll suck up as much pollen as they can. And then they'll use some uh, different means of getting the stuff that shouldn't sure. be in there out. Sure. And, and then they will concentrate it a little bit more and, and they will mix it with uh, some solutions that, uh, it's a buffered solution, Bocas solution is one of the ones they use, and, and some glycerin. And depending on what they're making the extract from, uh, they've pretty well got it down to how long you need to soak it and at what temperature and such. And, and then they strain it through a very fine filter. 
and the filter is very much like what we would use if we were going on a backpacking trip and we would pump through and what that does more or less is it filters out all the big stuff and it just leaves us with the uh, with the enzymes and the, and the stuff that would would be causing trouble I see. most of the most of the uh, extracts then are well I guess first of all they they do uh, a sometimes they do a concentration step sometimes not depending on on what it is uh, they always do uh, some uh, what they call countercurrent immunoelectrophoresis to be sure that all the major things are in there. Right. And, and there's usually several components that would be important for the different ones, all the different antigens. And, and if it's a little bit lacking in some, then just like blending coffee, they can add a little bit from a That's batch right. that was a little stronger in that. Dr. Block, unfortunately we are running out of time, but you have mentioned the, the di different treatments that we use for seasonal allergies. Are there treatments that are different for children or, or are they about the same? Uh, it's similar. Avoidance if you can. Mm -hmm. um, probably antihistamines and, and there's a number of them. Uh, over the counter now is available uh, uh, loratadine, which is Claritin, yes. and cetirizine, which is Zyrtec. Uh, Allegra is still prescription. Um, and there are several others too, Benadryl and mm -hmm. such. Uh, there are uh, nasal sprays that are good for children and, uh, and they are quite effective. There's eye drops that are quite effective. There's over-the-counter ones and prescription ones too. And, uh, those, and, and allergen immunotherapy, if we have a lot of trouble and, and we're not getting very good results with the uh, uh, medications. Now it's great to, to treat before you go out and get in trouble too yes, because it, you don't have to play catch up. It's just sure. like a basketball game. You don't want the other team to get ahead of you and you right. don't want the allergies to get ahead right. of you and are, are putting out a fire. You want it to wet the house down before it gets on fire right. uh, if you're in a brush fire or something and, and, and it's the same kind of deal. You want to get some antihistamine on board first before uh, your allergies get in such an uproar. Right. And, Lots and so and taking, lot. taking something before you go out. Would be preventative is so much better than playing catch up. That's right. Lots oh. and lots and lots of information today on allergies. And I know that our audience is um, very interested in, in everything that you have to say. So if you would like some more information from Dr. Block, um, his website, www.drfrancisblock.com, is an excellent resource. I went there um, today before I met Dr. Block, and it is a fantastic resource. Also, pollen.com, you can actually track your your allergies and um, sign up for a newsletter and um, some other things that you may be interested we'll also include those on the screen at the end of the show. Dr. Block thank you so much for um, coming to the studio today and speaking with us about allergies I know that's been very helpful to our our audience and we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Healthy Living. I am um, Kelly Lamb we hope to see you again next time.